Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, as we turn our thoughts and our words to consider the work that is before us that we are called to do, help us to remember that we are also called to play and to joy. Amen. I think that to, to understand Palm Sunday, I think that it's important to understand what Palm Sunday, what the story is being contrasted to. Because there is some context that existed at the time for the audience of this text and for the people who were there during Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that because our lives are different now and our context is different, I think it's easy to lose. And so it's important to have this context, I think, to have a sense of what's going on with Palm Sunday. Each year, when Passover was approaching, Pontius Pilate would have a triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Now, Pontius Pilate was a powerful Roman governor with thousands of Roman soldiers under his command. And so this would be an event of a great deal of pomp and ceremony, a really impressive display. Thousands of people in armor, spears, swords, shields, marching in lockstep, chanting, uh, singing the songs of their different cohorts, of their different units as they march by, cavalry officers riding with their horses, trumpets, people shouting. And the streets would have been lined with people there to greet the Roman governor as he entered Jerusalem. You would have the patricians and the wealthy and the powerful. You would have the temple authorities, members of the Sanhedrin, who would be there in their best dress. And they would all be waving and cheering for Pontius Pilate. And people would have prepared baskets of garlands of flowers and roses, and they would cast these flowers before the procession and rain them down on Pontius Pilate's head from rooftops as he marched into the city. Dragged behind him would have been some select criminals, people who had resisted the Roman occupation in different ways, bound and chained and ready to be publicly crucified after they arrived. Pontius Pilate didn't do this because he was devout or because he cared the slightest bit about Passover. He did this because around Passover, the city of Jerusalem would swell in population from about 10,000 people to over 100,000 people. Because everyone was coming in from the hills and the valleys and the villages and the towns for the high holy days to make sacrifices at the temple. And so imagine like 150,000 people coming to Phoenixville for Blobfest. Right? This would change what our town was like while it happened. And so, yes, people would be camping on the sidewalks, and there would definitely be no parking. There would be no parking for miles in every direction. But Passover wasn't just a celebration, like a fun time. Passover is a reminder to the Jewish people of when they were under the power of an oppressive empire. And when God came and, and, and uh, caused miracles through Moses, to liberate them from that oppressive empire. And they went out into the wilderness and had their wandering and ultimately came to the promised land. And so Passover, this combination of religious fervor and the reminder of God liberating them from an empire, people would cause trouble. There would be protests, there would be demonstrations, there might be violence that breaks out, there could have been attempted assassinations at this time and increasingly in years to come. 
And so Pontius Pilate, as governor, knew this, and he knew he had to be present. And not just present, but with a show of force. So that at every intersection and on every street and in front of every important building and marching down the side streets and the alleys were legionnaires ready to enforce Rome's will. An an oppressive regime usually loves pomp and ceremony. Like authoritarians love massive marches with row upon row of soldiers and tanks and missiles rolling down Main Street and bands playing patriotic music and banners and flags waving everywhere. They love this. The more authoritarian, the more pomp and ceremony you get. Like imagine dear leader's birthday in North Korea. That's what we're talking about. Compare that to uh, the birthday of the, of the prime minister of Iceland, where you can walk up to his house, knock on the door, talk to him, have tea with him if you want. No guards, right? The more authoritarian someone is, the more they love this pomp and ceremony because they're overcorrecting. Because they know that it's unnatural to make people live like this. It's unnatural to control other people's lives with violence. And so you've got to go over the top with the demonstration and the theater to justify it to yourself and to try to justify it to the people you're oppressing. In contrast to this, legitimate authority is effortless doesn't have to insist upon itself. It doesn't have to be imposed or inflicted. In this context, I think it's helpful to think of Palm Sunday and Jesus' glorious march into Jerusalem as essentially street theater. This is Jesus lampooning Pontius Pilate. Because Jesus isn't arriving on a mighty war horse, he's arriving on a donkey. And in fact, there's a detail in Matthew that I find hilarious that has been the subject of reams of paper of commentary over the generations. And I'm referring, of course, to the double donkey. Did anyone notice the double donkey? So in other synoptic gospels, Jesus rides a donkey into Jerusalem, but Matthew is very concerned with each thing Jesus does fulfilling prophecy. And so Matthew is always looking for where was there a prophecy that connects to something Jesus did. And so Matthew has this text that he references. And it seems from Matthew's version of this prophetic text that it's referring to to two donkeys, that the king, that the Davidic king comes riding in on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so for Matthew's text, Jesus and his disciples get double donkeys. And somehow Jesus is sort of, it isn't depicted exactly how this works, but Jesus rides both donkeys in this text. So you picture maybe he's like, um, like a Wild West performer, you know, with a foot in each saddle, kind of riding the donkeys, <laughs> like water skis, or maybe he's kind of like side saddle, you know, because one donkey's taller and one's smaller, a colt, so kind of lounging. Or maybe he's riding one donkey and leading the other, like a little baby donkey along next to him. Or maybe Matthew is working too hard <laughs> to make what happened fit this text exactly. Regardless, this is not, I don't think, meant to be a totally serious scene. Like where Pontius Pilate has roses and garlands thrown in front of him, people are just cutting branches off trees nearby and tossing those in the road. When Pontius Pilate had, uh, the patricians would come out and lay out their silks and their cloaks and their, and their fine garments on his path into the city. We have beggars and fellow homeless people and just regular folks taking their scraps off, throwing scraps in the street for Jesus to march over. 
Instead of thousands of soldiers marching in lockstep behind him, he has this weird amalgamation of disciples and people who are paying for his actual trip and uh, former lepers and people kind of who just, he has this train of people that follow him around. Not the kind of people you'd want for a revolution or to run a government. If Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was serious, he would have been killed right there. Like, Rome is not going to let a different king march into the city and make a legitimate claim on kingship. You're going to get your thousands of soldiers to surround the people, and then you're going to kill them. Very simple to handle. And they're unarmed, so it won't even be that difficult. So the authorities don't see this as real. Because if they did, they would have reacted differently, I think. And over time, they're going to see the reality of it, and they will react differently, but not here. However, the people are able to see what's happening. Because they are still shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the heir of David. And our text ends with Jesus being identified as, at the very least, a prophet from Galilee. So simultaneously, through this demonstration, the least of these can see what's going on, and the great are elsewhere. So like, imagine... Uh, a million people show up in Washington, D.C. for the inauguration of a homeless guy. Uh, you might recognize this homeless guy from some YouTube videos uh, where he did like some magic tricks. It's hard to remember. So many things are happening. You see so much weird stuff on the internet. But a million people show up in Washington, D.C. for an inauguration of this homeless guy. And so the day comes and there is a band of kazoos playing and marching in step and, and, and people with children's instruments, the kind of thing you'd be handed out in elementary school, making a bunch of noise. And instead of uh, an honor guard, there are homeless people pushing their carts, rattling along the street with their cans for recycling and their layers of jackets, no matter what the temperature is and they march through the streets. And then instead of soldiers in their uniforms, you have wage workers in their uniforms. So you have the, a Starbucks unit and some Carhartts and uh, some Walmarts and some Cintas food service type folks marching in their uniforms. All the people who work downtown but can't afford to live downtown because of all the rent hikes and investment properties, they've been driven a 45-minute bus ride away. And then this homeless man on, rolls in on a Segway, which was about the silliest conveyance I could think of. Even sillier if he's trying to go one foot on, on each of two Segways, right? But this homeless man rolls in on a Segway, waving. The kazoos take up the strain of hail to the chief, and then this homeless man on a Segway makes his way down the street to the city center. And everyone is watching. What is this guy going to do next? Pontius Pilate and his ilk love to demonstrate the power that they have through force, command, control, violence. This happens everywhere. It happened everywhere then, it happens everywhere now. It's the same language of violence and power and control. Power in the kingdom of God is something completely different. It is not the same. Jesus demonstrates his own power openly, utterly defenseless, completely unarmed, at most, maybe two swords and the whole mob with him. And he does so surrounded by the powerless. By people who might want to take over Jerusalem and drive out Rome, but they can't. This is what our text from Philippians looks like when it's acted out in public. So 
Some simple examples from our own practice as Presbyterians. I, as pastor, am, lim- am limited by the session. I'm not in charge. The session is in charge, made up of elders that you elect. The session's also limited. They can only serve for six years at the most before they, they have to go away. They have to stop. And all the people above us in the denomination, the Presbytery Synod General Assembly, are elders and pastors elected from amongst these leaders we've chosen. And they're also all limited. They have limited terms. They have limited powers. This isn't arbitrary. This isn't because we love committee meetings. This is a genuine attempt of our ancestors in faith to live this kind of kingdom power in the world, to make it the way that we do business, so that things are as open as they possibly can and as flat as they possibly can be, and everyone can participate. It's a way of trying to live the opposite of the way Pontius Pilate and his ilk want us to live. Jesus is essentially throwing a party And it is a party to which we are invited, and it is a way of life that we can choose if we have the courage to do so. The kingdom is a street party instead of a military parade. It's homeless people instead of the governor. It's rags and branches instead of roses and garlands. And it's a glimpse of what it actually looks like to serve Jesus and not Pilate. Amen.